Hey, Major. Welcome to the next edition of Rally's Founder Talk. Um, we're very excited, obviously, to have a major here on, on this call with us. Uh, <laughs> ben was just making fun of me about my, my, my dad jokes. He's, 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 I didn't know that would be a dad joke to, to, to have a background behind me with Fort Bragg. He's like, what's up with Fort Bragg? And I said, well, because Major's what, on the phone. That's what makes it a dad joke. <laughs> don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I don't even know. But I see you have C major there, which is a, a feels like a more musical thing versus a <laughs> Look, I hear everything. C major, I'm C minor. It's, it's always a joke, yeah. but I'm here for No, that. you're always major. And we're happy that major you're with us today because you're a major deal. Um, and so let's let, let us tell you about Rally a little bit. Um, yeah. I think you already know some of this, but Rally exists to, to help um, very passionate social entrepreneurs in the early stages of, of their work transform their um, ventures into sustainable or transform them into sustainable ventures that create positive social change. Um, one of the things we like to say is that uh, another thing we like to say is that uh, Orlando uh, is a hub for social entrepreneurs. And the reason why we can say that confidently is because we believe we have all the resources uh, necessary for people, no matter where they're at in the world, to make a stop through here if they're a social entrepreneur. Um, one of those resources is people like you, right? Um, so we want to highlight the fact that we have some major, major people going on here. And um, they should stop through here if they want to have some major movement in their major work. What do you think about that? Hey, I love it. You love it? All right, cool. I'm glad you love it. I love it. Uh, Major, so we start these things off the same way all the time, uh, which is uh, a question that um, we'd like you to ruminate on a little bit uh, before you answer. Uh, but it's, talk to us about Major Minor, a little Major, a little Major, uh, wherever you were at, uh, yeah. more specifically, what was Little Major's life like? Um, uh, what were the things that were around you that allowed you to become a big major as you moved through life? Like the, the environment, uh, the circumstances. Talk to us about that. Well, Little Major, um, going all the way back to my inception, I was actually born on a military base, so my family is military. And um, yes, yeah, so I was born in Fort Benning, Georgia. And my family is originally from Florida, but my parents, um, they met when they were kids. They grew up literally around the corner from each other. So when my dad joined the military, they moved away together and then we started to travel the world. So I was born in Fort Benning, Georgia. Then we moved to Germany. And then I moved to upstate New York, which is where my parents actually got a divorce and then my dad went off to Korea and did all these tours and Afghanistan and all these different places. And we stayed there. So I actually grew up in upstate New York and that formed a big part of who I am today. So I grew up somewhat in a silo. So it was literally just my immediate family, my brother and my mom and my sister and myself. And we made life um, up there. You know, our friends became our family. We would travel back and forth to Florida every summer. So I always had a connection to Florida, uh, even though I didn't live here. And it was doing, during that time that, you know, my mom, I got to watch her as an entrepreneur my whole life, but I didn't really know that she was an entrepreneur. I just knew that she was a hairstylist and that she owned her own salon. Mm -hmm. But back then, you know, we didn't call it like entrepreneurship or anything, or at least we didn't. It was just, yeah, like you're just my a mom business owner. Like, you know? Yeah. So, um, but watching her, you know, work tirelessly, like every day, she would come home late. Um, it really, I think it showed me what life could be if I did own a business one day or if I didn't work for someone. Um, but I didn't, it didn't really translate in my mind until I got much older, really until I owned a business and people would ask me this question. I was like, oh, I actually did see entrepreneurship my whole life. I just didn't know what to call it. And um, I had to work at a really young age. So, you know, although my dad was present, but from afar, my mom was very much so still a single mother raising three kids all the way in the North when all of her family was in the South. So I became super independent really fast. Like I was a kid who 
who you support on base, which is where people who like work um, or serve in the military, they live. And then people who aren't in the military live off base as civilians. So we would go on base because we had access to my dad and I would buy candy from um, this place, which is a grocery store, but it's called the commissary on base. And I would buy candy. And back then I think it was like 25 cents for like a Snickers and Skittles and all those things. And then I would bring them back to school and I would flip them in the in the classroom. So I would sell them for like a dollar. Oh yeah, you're the candy I girl. Was the, I was the candy girl. So, <laughs> usually, um, usually in, 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 in the community I grew up in, the candy lady was a, candy was a lady. whole auntie. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's yeah. a little different in your world. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so it was a little different, but I know because remember I used to come to Florida every summer. So my grandma yeah. was actually the candy lady. So she had oh, like, see. <laughs> eggs and everything. Yeah. So um yeah so I became the candy girl around school and then I ended up um, getting my first job at Arby's and then I just I became like fast food from then on Wait, and, pause. yeah you worked at you worked at Arby's I did and the crazy people thing have been for years trying to figure out how their business fired. model works they <laughs> fired me which is they crazy. Fired me. They fired me. <laughs> which makes why. sense I don't know because... why they fired me well, I'm going to tell you why. Because for years, Arby's has been trying to sabotage your business model, but for some reason, it's not working. Um, so, because we're trying to figure out, like, nobody eats at Arby's, and everybody I know who worked at Arby's got fired, and they're excellent people Perfect. like yourself, Major. So, oh, they make some of the best curly fries. So, but I actually really enjoyed my work there. And um, from there, that sent me on much higher heights to McDonald's. And I worked there for <laughs> many years and I love that. So when you talk about like little major and you know how I became the woman I am today, it was those times, you know, where I had to open the store in the morning with the rest of the opening crew at like I had to be there like 4 a.m. because back then, you know, there wasn't 24 hours, but we would open yeah. at five, you know, I'm cleaning out um you know, things from the night before or prepping, you know, for the day. It just, I think those times taught me work ethic of being on time, being a reliable teammate, showing up, customer service. Like you just gain so much in fast food and retail environments that it's really hard to put in words until you actually do it. So I'm so grateful for that time. And, um, and for my mom who really, she didn't give me much because she wanted me to work for it. So she gave me everything that I needed, but for the things that I wanted, she made me work for it. So when I got that job at McDonald's, I saved all my checks and we would always go to New York City for, um, for school shopping. So I would save up all my cash and that's how I was able to get, you know, the clothes that I wanted, the sneakers that I wanted, and like, you know, yeah. look cool, all that stuff. But it really just taught me, you know, the power of hard work and, you know, when I apply myself, like good things can happen. So yeah, yeah that, I think that really impacted me all the way up until my junior year, which is when I moved to Florida. And that's how my journey in this state started. I, so a couple of things. One, I'm, I'm surprised your mother, did your mother ever have you working at the shop? Like washing hair, no, cleaning up hair? Not. I wish she no. would have, but she did not. I would just yeah. go there really late after she would be done with her clients and get my hair done back in the day. But no, she never had me work there. Did she allow you to sell about. candy to your um, to her customers? No, that was a school um, thing. <laughs> it's funny how like how much of that is like osmosis. Like she didn't sit you down and teach you that it was that you had the capability of starting something. No. But there's something about like having that in your family where you realize regular people figure out how to take responsibility and make something work. And I feel like so much of like entrepreneurship is the like willingness to be the one holding the ball, like to be the one who at the end of the day, it's your responsibility, whether it works or fails. And seeing someone doing that when you're young and realizing, oh, it's, it's not, it won't kill me. Um, it, I'm capable and normal people take this risk of responsibility. And you can see it already that a high schooler could be an opener at McDonald's and show up on time and take that responsibility. 
like the older I get, the more that statement is true. So few people want to take responsibility for anything, you know, and it's just interesting to hear you getting that from watching your parents. It would be an interesting little study to find out how many people start businesses, watched someone else in their family as they grew up start businesses, because I think it, you learn so much from that. Yeah, you definitely do without even having like- Not even realizing it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was really- Really so you were like in real life. Yeah. Um, there was a commercial, a McDonald's commercial back in the day of this oh boy. outstanding gentleman named Calvin. I think that well, was I name. was not Calvin. But <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's good. They should have used you instead, Major, in that commercial. Maybe, but maybe, yeah, <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right. So, so you were you were the candy girl. You worked at uh, McDonald's, which is noble. I worked at Pizza Hut. Um, oh, okay just to, for the same reasons because I, I wanted to look fresh on my first day of school <laughs> and so Pizza Hut was the route they gave me into fret to put me into freshness I do remember getting my first check and thinking who's this uh <laughs> this name I was like who's this person taking half my check I couldn't understand yeah. like they they cheated yeah. me I was like where's the rest of my money <laughs> um, <laughs> I remember he that still feeling takes like all of our money. He still takes all of our money, whoever this person is. Yeah, whoever that person <laughs> is. But I remember like that vividly, like where this person took half my money. And that was a major <laughs> thing to me. Um, so you went to you went to UCF. Uh did the candy business extend over there or did you say did you hang that up so, and just say I'm gonna be about I these actually, books? I transitioned from fast food to retail. So I won't even name all the jobs I had in retail. But I had a lot, and then when I was in when I was at UCF, uh, I don't know. I wish I had the stamina that I did back then because I did nine internships when I was in college. Because mm. I don't know why. I think I've always, I'm a three on the enneagram, you know. So I, I do a lot. Is. You know, I'm familiar with the enneagram. You know what the enneagram. I keep is. hearing about it, but I don't know what a three is. I'm not I proficient am. at it. What's so, a three? Threes, in a lot of ways, are achievers. Um, and when we're not in our best, like mental um, capacity, or we're not like in our best place, we tend to um, we tend to allow the work that we do to um, become our value. And mm -hmm. if we're not succeeding in work, then we're not as valuable as people. And that's like an unhealthy part of it. So, um, but the good part of it is, I just really want to work I've never shied away from work I'm like a sponge I like to learn about random things and just get my hands into a ton of things that sometimes don't have anything to do with me or my future or my present but when I was in college I think I'd realized early on even though no one had told me that what I was learning in school wasn't everything that I really needed to get the job that I wanted when I graduated. Mm -hmm. So I figured if I could just work with a ton of people, I can at least find out what I like and what I don't like. And that took me from, you know, interning here in Orlando to moving away. I found a place on Facebook, like a, it was like, you know, people used to rent out their apartments on Facebook when they were going like subleasing. I subleased an apartment in LA and found an internship and moved out there for a summer. And that gave me a lot of clarity and vision. And when I came back, I did a handful more internships until I found my, my first job. Well, oh, that's interesting. So, so that um, the internship was it in California, was it also retail based? It was actually fashion. So it okay. was a okay, PR fashion. internship. Yep. So I went to UCF for, I was an PR major. So advertising and public relations. Mm -hmm. And um, I really thought that I wanted to work in fashion. I was really, really big into that industry back then. And um, that internship showed me that I actually didn't want to work in the fashion industry, but it was wow. great. Um, well, the internship that I had, it was a lot of grunt work, but I had managed to surpass the work of the other intern so that I didn't get as much grunt work. I got to actually do writing, which was cool, but it was, I wasn't sold on the concept of working in the fashion industry. I, I, I don't know why. Um, it was just something about it. it was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. And when I got back, I interned at the Chanel and the um, Mall at Millennium. And that was awesome. 
and it showed me a lot, but I don't know, I guess I'm not, I won't give myself too much credit, but I think there were just some, some things that were popping up in my life that just showed me that maybe that particular industry wasn't the way for me. And um, yeah, I'm glad I didn't make that decision, but things became much more formalized over the years once I got my first job. And I, and I, it, I clearly realized why I didn't go in the fashion industry because I found food. You found food. I found food. Yep. That's, that sounds loaded. What, what does that mean? It's like, you found well, food. <laughs> yeah. like, so, where was it underneath your bed or? Yeah, well, I, my very first job, it was at a PR agency um, that had an office. Oh, here Rockaway. Florida. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they have That's an office in Miami and they have an, I believe they still have an office here. And I remember walking into this office that's about the size of maybe a pretty decent walk-in closet in someone's home. So it was really small. And there was this woman and she had these bell-bottom pants on and no shoes. And she interviewed me for a job. She was really boho. And she gave me the job. And my first clients were some really random events that I really won't go into right now for sake of time. But I also worked on a lot of local food restaurants. And when I started to work with them, I re like all these light bulbs went off inside of me. And I realized just how much I loved food. And looking back now, telling you my story, it's like food has always been there. But um, I got to realize just how much I love the industry, the points of connection it allows you to have with people. And I got to support local businesses, which is like a big part of my why and why I do what I do. So being able to do all three, I didn't realize like how important that was to me. And it also gave, gave me like deeper connections in Orlando because before that it was kind of like a place where I lived, but I didn't like it because I was from New York. I was really only here for a couple of years. And then it was like, all right, I guess I'll make this my home. But it was that that job that really allowed me to uh, become planted in the city and stay here and happily be here versus just like, oh, yeah. Orlando. Yeah. You know? I like, there's a couple of things in, in that season that's super interesting. One, it's like, it's very cool that you gave yourself permission to find a space that matched with your passion so that you, I could imagine a situation where, um, you made the decision based on uh, where the most money is. So maybe there's more money in fashion in California or like, but this idea that all oh, this industry doesn't match me, let me keep finding internships to find something that aligns with what I'm really excited about. I think that's more sustainable, whether you're in entrepreneurship or in working for a corporation, if you can align it with something that you care about. So I think it's cool that you did that. And then I think it's also cool that you that you picked a place like that, that, that you were able to say, I'm going to be here in Orlando and commit to this place. Were both of those decisions conscious? Like, I want to find something that I'm passionate about and I want to find a place or that was just natural to you? Nope. Or nope. So I'll give you the really short version of all of that. I had zero idea about really what I wanted to do. When I went to UCF, well, my goal was to move from Florida when I graduated back up to New York. I really wanted to go to Syracuse University. And um, I realized very quickly that I could go to school for free in Florida. So that was like a no brainer. So I picked UCF so that I could stay at home. I really wanted to be a dance major because my goal was I wanted to open up a dance studio. But my mom told me that was not a real job, which you know, <laughs> that is a real job. But in her mind, it just, she wanted me to work, as she would say, in computers or something. So I'm like, uh, that's not really like my thing. I'm not like a coder or anything. <laughs> but um, right, right, computers, right? So, um, so I remember flipping through the degree catalog at UCF in like one of these like study halls. And I just came across like advertising and public relations. And I read the description. And there were some shows on like MTV and stuff at the time with like publicists. And I was oh, like, yeah. I was reading it. And I was like, I think I can do that. This sounds like, I mean, I like to write. I like to read. I like people. All right, let's do it. So it really wasn't like, 
this thing where I was like, oh my gosh, I love that. It was literally, this sounds like something I can do. I applied for the major after, you know, I got in and, um, and then life started from there. But I always wanted to get back. I was always on a hunt to get somewhere else other than this city. Like, um, even when I graduated, I thought, even though I said I didn't want to do fashion, I was still applying for fashion jobs in New York. I was like, well, maybe I'll work for Chanel corporate, or maybe I'll go work for XYZ company in New York. Like, you know, that was my big goal was to get back to where I was from, but just to do it on a bigger scale. And that even lasted maybe even a couple years into my career. I had this stint where I was going to join the military. And then I was going to join, um, I applied for my master's degree and wanted to move away. So it was, I felt like I was always searching for something or something more. And um, thankfully now I'm at a place where I feel like everything that I want, I can either go get by a vacation or partnership but really the things that I need are right here where I am. So I wish I could say I really was like on the hunt for like my passion or the things that I loved. It was none of that. It was literally just um, living my life and really exploring as a, as a young adult and giving myself the room and flexibility to say like, I like this, I like that. Well, let's do a little bit of it all, which is kind of what I still do today. And um, it still serves me well, but I still come to those like crossroads of like, okay, major, what are you doing here? Like how many things can you really do in your life? But um, yeah. having some sort of central th theme for me has um, served me well. So at least can be like my baseline. So it's like, yeah. if it doesn't match that, then I'm not going to do it. Same. Yeah, major. I remember um, your, as you were talking through your story, uh, it, it, it reminded me a lot about my journey and, um, and how, I was, when I came to Orlando, I was, and there was points where I was always trying to get out, right? Like I was trying to leave and go places. <laughs> I just, that just didn't happen for me. Uh, and, 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 and I kept coming back here and, and I remember the, the CEO, the former CEO of the YMCA is, is saying to me that I would never get what I was looking for out of Orlando unless I committed to the city, right? Um, he said it in a much more offensive, well, it was an offensive way, uh, but it made sense to me later on. Um, and so I determined to commit to the city and, and simultaneously I was also looking for my passion. And, and it's a good thing because life has expanded for me in multiple ways, just like yourself. Like I'm involved in multiple things. Yeah. I found my wife here. You found your husband here, I think, right? You found yeah. him here? Yeah, I did. Okay. So that's, so, I mean, I guess it made sense, right? That you yeah. stayed here. Okay. So that's good. Um, I want to talk about this, this, uh, this popcorn thing here. Yeah. I mean, I've had some, I think it's delicious. Um, <laughs> people I've seen eat it think it's delicious too. Um, <laughs> what, like, where, where did that come from? Yeah. So it actually came out of one of those desires to do more and exploring because I felt like what I was doing wasn't enough. So I had a full-time job at the time when I created this company and it all started off as kind of like this, uh, wasn't an accident by any chance. It was definitely, um, I don't know, I guess it was like, a, well, it started off as a Christmas gift. So my former employer bought me, there was this brand that used to exist um, some years ago called Sea Wonder. I used to really like it. Um, and they had this um, air popper popcorn machine. And my former uh, leader of the company, she really thought that I would love it. She's like, oh, Major, you know, she loves this brand. I was just going to buy it for her. It was like a cute add on to the bigger Christmas gift she got me. So when she got me the popcorn popper, I literally started to make popcorn for the team. Like, every day and I was coming up with like all these flavors and ingredients and all these things and I would be like here taste this taste that and I would always do it on our lunch break and, and um, at the time I was like the leader of the office so I really helped set the tone in the office so I always wanted to make it fun so it was like okay it's popcorn time or you know whenever we celebrated it was always a, a chance for us to eat so um, I got to be really um 
engage in that little project at the time. And then I kind of let it go. And in the February of the next year, we went to Miami for the South Beach Wine and Food Festival. And um, there was a company and they were doing a limbo contest. And I, um, I won the limbo contest and I won, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I want a $50. I don't believe you. Where's the video? Footage. I have footage. I have, I'll send it to you. <laughs> there yeah. is, um, I got one, a $50 Williams Sonoma gift card. And I thought to myself, I'm going to buy a better popcorn machine. And I did. And um, I started dreaming up this idea of this popcorn business that I still haven't implemented to this day. So I'm not going to talk about it because if I do it one day, it's going to be cool. But um, I started dreaming up this idea idea I like typed it out I was more organized about that than I am my business today which is the wildest thing but I was dreaming it up and um I ran into a friend who I used to be really cool with and we connected and we were like hey let's start a business together and we were like okay well, let's do it so around the same time East End here in Orlando they were hosting a foodpreneur series so she and I thought, well, let's team up and let's go to the first one and let's create this business. So we thought we were going to launch a juice company. Well, little did we know how expensive at the time it would be to like get like fresh organic everything for this juice company. So that kind of went by the wayside and we thought, okay, well, let's do soap. So we were there in the first course and it was like a three-part series where they teach you like about the business and how to get things started. Well, between the first class and the second class, she just totally fell off the face of the earth. And I was left with like, well, what am I gonna do? And um, on the second course, second day of the class, I actually locked myself out of my apartment when I lived right off, I lived in Hannibal Square in Winter Park. There was no Uber back then. And I had to walk from downtown Winter Park all the way to East End Market because I was clearly passionate about going back to this course and I thought well since she's gone I'm gonna roll with this popcorn idea that I've always had and it was at that time where I literally I came up with the business I had to come up with like a logo ingredients made a website everything I literally made everything in like a couple of weeks and the third part was you had to showcase your business to the public so that they could give you feedback and um there was one flavor that went really, really well, which is my OG flavor that I still sell today. And we just started from there. And um, the, the, the whole back, like the background of why I created the popcorn company was because I really wanted to just do something like entrepreneurial. Like I always felt like it was in me, but I didn't really know how to do it. And um, I was, I'm still that aunt, my nieces call me their TT, who, you know, walks around with like, what they call weird healthy snacks. And I wanted to create a snack that I felt really good about feeding them because the ingredients were carefully chosen and selected um, with things that I felt good about giving them. And I feel like if anything is good enough for them, it's good enough for the world. And that still remains true for the company today. So I don't use like any preservatives, um, any weird flavors or ingredients or additives, um, very simple, sometimes no more than like four ingredients in each bag of popcorn. And um, yeah, it's carried us through to this day. So that's kind of how I got to the popcorn and you know, the, the premise behind it. I got it. One, I love the popcorn. Two, it's inspired me to make popcorn. So I like started yeah. popping popcorn on the stove at home. Instead of, yeah. Instead of, but, when do you add the flavors? How do you get the flavors onto the popcorn? Does that go after you mix it in? So it depends. So I actually just rolled out a pumpkin spice popcorn for my PSL fans. Um, and that one is the first time I've ever added really anything after I make it. So um, like, for example, I'll just talk about that one. So when I pop it, you know, I'm popping with like an organic virgin coconut oil, but I add in um, an organic cinnamon oil when it's popping. So it picks up that cinnamon and coconut oil flavor. And then the sugar when it's, when I'm making it. And then the only thing I add after it is a pump, uh, organic pumpkin spice blend and that's it. But like for our OG flavor, the only thing I add after 
after I make it is salt to salt the popcorn. You so, salt it after. Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah. Okay. Don't salt it beforehand. Um, some people say you can do that, but don't do that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so. Major, can you talk about how you came up with the name? Because I know there's oh. more in the name than just. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So at that time, there was a lot of project everything. Like, uh, and I was, I can get really stuck in something and not make a decision because I have too many choices. And um, that's kind of how it was with this name. So it just used to be Eat Project Pop and our Instagram handle is Eat Project Pop. And um, so I thought, well, I could just make it a project because it was a project. So I was like, I'll call it Project Pop. And I hated the name for years and years and years. And I always thought, you know, I don't really want to do this because I'm going to change the name anyway. And I don't want to invest in that because the name is going to change. And last year, I think I was, um, I was, I was coming home from popping. It was like three o'clock in the morning and I was getting up. In the wait, wait, did you all hear that? Well, some people are working extra hours right now for their jobs and it takes a lot of time. She just said she was coming home from popping popcorn at three o'clock in the morning. So we all do things for seasons. Don't be discouraged yeah. if you're well, working yeah. forever, it'll be forever. Yeah. So <laughs> because at that time I was still working my full-time job. So, um, you know, popping would come at night or really early in the morning. So I got home. I remember like getting ready for bed and I went up, I got up and I'm, this is going to be a little vivid, but I just paint the picture to show just how like things can come in like the most like spontaneous moments. But I was so exhausted and I was getting up to go use the bathroom in the middle of the night. So I was like just dead tired. My feet were hurting. I was exhausted. And I, I don't know why I was thinking about Project Pop. Well, because I was popping, but I don't know why I was thinking about our name. And um, it came to me and I really think that it was like a God-given thing. I just heard like um, people over profits. And I was like, oh, that's an acronym. People okay. over profits. I was like, what is this? What is this? And then my brain started going, it was like purpose over profits. And I was like, oh my God. And in that moment, I like fell in love with the name because for so long, it was just something I just made up. And then it took a really long time. And I think it was actually after me living out that mission without really knowing that I was doing that for the name did we come um, like solidified. And um, so now the name is, I just took away the eats, added majors. So it's majors project pop. So yeah, when people, you know, ask me like, you know, what do we stand on or what principles do we stand on? Um, it's people and purpose over profits. And um, yeah, so that's how the name came to be and how we found meaning many years later. <laughs> that, that sounds like a, di a dip set song to me. Um, Which one? I don't Which know part? You know, I know people Dipset. Profits. <laughs> yeah, oh, I knew you, I knew you oh, did. Yeah. Maybe the rest of the people are called. <laughs> Definitely Ben does not. Uh, <laughs> so, but I was like, oh, that's, that sounds tough. People over profits. I really love that. Um, and, and I can hear how you earlier talked about the fact that for food, there's this thing about people that the connection of uh, that people have with food and there's this relational aspect of it so that makes yeah. a lot of sense to me um um where's where's where where where, where are you at right now uh, ben talked about some or maybe it was casey talked about some stuff with with oprah winfrey and eddie murphy and all those people like, what's going on um <laughs> uh, well right now we're in a very interesting place because mm -hmm. um, in april of this year i left my full-time job. Um, I was a director of a, a region here in Orlando for a PR office. And um, I left that to pursue full-time PR and popcorn, which has been my life, but in very different capacities um, yeah. up until this year. So right now I'm really just, um, I'm coming out of a season of recovery because last year was a lot. There was a lot of success that I did not expect. So um, am, amid everything else that was going on in the world. So I, I had a lot of, um, I guess, and, then, and now I've, I think I've processed it much better, but a lot of grief and guilt associated with the success that the brand had last year. 
because, um, you know, amid all the social injustice, a lot, a lot of black businesses were catapulted to the forefront. And that meant that people and brands that maybe you had never heard of before were now all of a sudden all over the place. And I'm very thankful and fortunate that my brand was one of them. But I, because I have a lot of um, empath tendencies, I felt like it took the death of many people for a business like mine, and I've been doing this for what feels like a very long time to be seen. So, um, and I know it's a very, and somehow in some ways I feel like it's a very selfish way to think, but it's also just like my brain, like, you know, I don't, I wish that it could have been different, like that it didn't take all of that for, you know, my business to now be in this magazine, on that website, in this celebrity's hand, and da, da, da. And it's very cool, but I dealt with a lot of like, just guilt in that time. So, so many things that happened last year, I didn't tell anybody about, like besides maybe my close friends and they would like force me to celebrate, like major, be happy, this is awesome. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but so um, after all of that, I think this year and taking the big leap of faith to leave my job and be able to, you know, focus on this a lot more, I'm in a place of, um, I'm still trying to figure out what the heck I'm doing because I was very used to um, making this business work on very limit, limited time. And there's so much creativity that can happen when you've got like this amount of time between like getting off work and having to go to sleep or helping out friends or if you're a parent, like putting your kids to bed, like those couple of hours, it just creates this like drive in you to like get it done. And now that my days are so much open, sometimes it's like, all right, I'm going to go work out this morning and then I'm just <laughs> going to like figure out my day. So um, yeah. me figuring out my schedule and how to scale this business has become something I'm thinking about much more, but I had to realize that like, hey, for this business to be successful, I need to be well rested. I need to have like clarity in my mind and like lot less stress going on inside of me because I realized that that was a driver and what I was doing I was so stressed and bound up it was like I'll just work 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 um but now I have a lot more time to to dream again which is really important for the business because I didn't I was just making it work and not really having a chance to think about well what does the next six months look like well I don't really know now is a great time for me to really think about that but um Right what are now, some of those activities that, that you're, um, so it sounds like you're, I, one of the things I want to say is I, I agree with is, or is that when, when there's very limited resources that we tend to, like I, 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 I've always said one of the biggest killers I think of a lot of businesses is when they get like an influx of cash at the wrong time. Um, yeah. There's something about having very limited cash, very limited time where you just get more stuff done. Um, I experienced that both from the cash side I experienced that both on the time side now that, you know, like I'm a father, like I got to like windows where I got to get it, ha I have to make it happen and I just get a lot done. And I always say to people, like, I'm more productive now um, than I was as a single man. And, I'm, and I'm, that blows my mind. And I feel like I wasted a lot of my life with it because of that. <laughs> um, but, but moving, moving to like where you, so I get that. Um, but moving where, where you're at now, like, um, and, like what are the some of the practical things that you're thinking about in in running this business you've got some success in terms of just yeah. brand awareness and stuff like what are some of the pieces that you're you're really focusing on putting in place to yeah. help get it to where you're going to where you want to take it yeah so i realize that i don't really have a lot of strong systems and this is something my husband tells me all the time like you need systems you need systems and systems to me is kind of like a curse word and i'm trying to be better about it so um right now i am actually trying to outsource a couple of things so like my newsletter i think i have like a pretty decent size list but there's so much more room for growth and there's so much um connection that I can have with like my, what I call them my snackers through that list, as well as like sales. So trying to nurture that a bit. 
somebody on how to really maximize like your newsletter contacts and how to like um, convert them into like lifelong customers and believers in what you do. So that's a big thing for me right now. I'm, I'm also applying for some more grants and it's crazy because typically I would like never apply for things because I always thought in my mind, like there's probably somebody else that maybe needs the money more because I had a full-time job. So it was like anything I really needed, I could kind of float, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, now it's like, oh no, I, I need that grant. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I uh, applying for some grants recently have really shown me, you know, when someone asks, like, what are you going to do with this $25,000? I've like figured out to the penny what I'm going to do with that dollar. And it shows me all the areas that I need to be better at my business. So a couple of things. So what are those have, areas? Unpack those, yeah. those so, things, like in buckets, right? You don't yeah, have to itemize. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, branding and um, communications so I have to realize that like I can only do so much you know so when you're a creator of anything right we have we become everything the photographer the social media manager the everything so I really need to outsource some of that help um, to be able to just to make things better so I'm investing in some asset development whether it's like better news um, newsletter content social media content photography and such I'm also um, trying to streamline some of my operations. So right now we use bags and I literally have to like put the label on each bag. I'm trying to be done with that. So um, I'm outsourcing that to a company and the labels are gonna be printed on the bags, which is gonna be the biggest thing that has probably ever happened to me in the, this whole business because it's it's gonna be the end of, big, the yeah. of me putting labels. It's, it's gonna give you more time. I mean, yes. so what you gonna do with that time? Right. So right now I've thankfully have been able to find someone who is just as um, particular as me when it comes to label um, um, adherence. So I pay somebody now, but, you know, I, I can yeah. utilize her for other things. So that's a big part of the business. I'm also uh, going to be able to invest in someone who's going to be able to help me figure out like all these like tax nuances and business operations and things that I'm just naturally not great at. Like I just got yeah. QuickBooks, you know? So it's like, how, how do I really work this? Like, I wanna make sure I get it right. So I'm, I have a line item to, um, to pay for somebody who can really sit down with me and help me make sure I get it right because you don't wanna play with the IRS, okay? You need to give them their money. Yeah. Um, and I always like to give them their money, but I don't wanna give them a dollar more than what I need to give them. So, um, that's like a big thing. Um, another big thing is I really want to um, just give like um, some gratitude money to my mentor. So they allow me to utilize their space in Sanford to house my popcorn machine. And they don't charge me like a certain rate every hour or whatever. So I have a line item in there. I'm like, I want to give this to them because first of all, they deserve it. Second of all, you know, I would just believe in honoring the people that have like aided in your business. So there's just a couple of things, but I think that shows like, it just runs the gamut, like all over the business, like yeah. whether it's operations, branding, production. I need help to fuel all of that right now. So when I got asked that question, like, what are you going to do with this money? It made me think like, oh, okay, these are all the areas that I could be better in and this money could help me get there so um i'll find out in maybe a week or so if i get if i got it so well one of the things i like about that major is like i think you kind of rush uh blew by it but that idea that your business was at a place where it was driven by necessity and and high stress and you wanted to transition out of that so that the stress wasn't the motivator for you anymore or the high pressure wasn't the motivator for you anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think transitioning out of that space is not something that every entrepreneur actually does. And, and it's not necessarily only a product of the size. Some people can continue to create emergencies because it's the only thing that can motivate them to get any work done right yeah. like and so i think like the idea that you want to move past that is um like i don't know how that occurred to you but i think it's significant that it did occur to you and i like what you just did there about the explaining a little bit about how you moved through that 
because what I heard you saying in that grant application is you understood Sterling to like this. You under, understood yourself well enough to know uh, areas where you were not good. Like, I think, I think one of the signs of maturity is knowing what you're bad at, you know? And like, and so like to part of the way I hear you saying you're moving out of this crisis management or stress producing business is getting clear on the things that you need other people to do yeah. and trying to find a way to get other people to be doing those things. And that transition is, can be very difficult for entrepreneurs. So it's cool to hear you building a strategy around that and that you've got project or majors project pop to a place where it's ready to do that. I think that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's, let's, cause we, we got about 12 minutes. Let's open it up uh, to the fellows. Fellows, um, we just heard major story. Uh, anybody has some questions, raise your hand. Oh, Kia, there you go. Yes. Hi there. Hi. Thanks for sharing. This was great. Um, so I'm kind of a planner, but I do believe that marketing is everything. Yeah. So I'm curious to learn what kind of um, hacks or marketing tips came directly from your work as a publicist uh, and how did that help to enhance your business? Because I imagine you had... Um, you know, kind of an advantage in that way uh, compared to most other entrepreneurs. Yeah, no, for sure. So it's crazy because the biggest part of what I actually do for my business, I never did until last year, which is pitch the company to different news outlets for coverage because I didn't want, I knew that there was a potential that it could lead to a lot more sales that I couldn't handle. So I always shied away from that. But the other parts of what I've learned over the years, whether it be um, organization or strong writing capabilities or um, working with brands to make them look show ready and ready for the world is a big part of um, what I've done. So I, I tried to think about that when I created the company. Like I always wanted to feel, you know, organic and local, but I, always, I wanted to be able to like stand up very strongly next to like a national brand if you were to put a side by side in like a news um like a magazine spread but um some of the key things i think would just be like the writing and the communications you know i think a lot of times when we're trying to get something off the ground the things that really really matter um we sometimes do and sometimes we don't and i think one thing that really matters is you have to show up with like a really strong web presence so even if it's just your website, it needs to look good. If you're going to invest in something, you know, invest in a website. And I didn't pay anybody. I've if you go to my website today, that's made by major. So um, I just found ways to utilize like some of the skills I had and things I've seen and heard over the years to build something that would look ready for the world. Because when people look you up, whether you own um, a technology company or soap brand or whatever it is, they want to see that your website looks like something that they would probably support or they would shop or they would send somebody else's way or feel good about it. If it's like, hey, I'm an investor and I want to share this with someone, you know, that website, you got to show up and you got to look good. So um, I think my biggest things are just like writing and just knowing how to, how to deal with people. Um, because a lot of times, a lot of I meet a lot of business owners, they're not good on that side. It's like, I'm good at what I do, but the people thing and dealing with like outsiders is not really my thing. Uh, but just know, knowing how, learning how to work with various clients. I've worked with Ben in the past and um, just learning how to work with people is one of the biggest things that I think translates well into what I do right now as a business owner from the PR side. The major, uh... This is a picture of your popcorn. I'm a, my beer is integrating with it a little bit, so I apologize. Um, but uh, yeah, your website is really cool. I was looking at it, and uh, one of the things I really love about it is like you got the images. It, it does look very clean. Like if I didn't know, I would have thought that it was built by a bigger organization, which is really cool, especially after hearing your story. Um, and then the other thing um, I think that's really 
really cool about it is the fact that you're you don't shy away from your purpose um it is squarely there underneath the bag of popcorns right and, and, uh, and i think that's really cool so um yeah I'm a, i think I'm gonna I'm I'm peruse that thing and order some stuff for the holiday so i appreciate you uh any other well, questions anything, let me know what'd you say you just drop it out that you're local so if you want anything i can just drop it off to you you don't have to that's what i'm talking out. about it's all that's that's exactly yeah. what i'm talking about um any other fellows dp you got anything we can't hear you dp I think a lot of what you said was really um, a, a, a lot of where I am too, Major. So thank you for that. And uh, we share a lot of uh, similar, um, uh, you know, pain points, I think. So yeah, um, yeah. I'm going to check out your site and uh, follow some of your advice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Doria, you know, like for you, I think, I think her site is also a wonderful example of probably somewhat how you should be positioning your tiles at some point in, in your work, right? Um, and uh, so it'll be, it would be cool to have a conversation with you afterwards about yeah. you know, what, what you can learn from her site. Um, anybody else, uh, Joe, uh, VJ, Ken Peach, Sandra? I, I was just, I enjoyed the discussion about the identifying early on the um, love of working um, and uh, you know what you could learn and and applying what you were learning because you know so many people look at fast food as though that's the last place I want to work and yet you know you obviously in, engaged in that and and made the best of it both for the clients and for yourself and um, I was always concerned that my kids you know uh, get out there get started and at first it was you mean I have to go to work but they very quickly gained an appreciation. Of course, they all got to work at Universal Studios, so life oh, wasn't too bad. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, and they've been, I think, successful the way they are now because they did get an early start. You know, I started in my mid-teens and it was a wonderful opportunity. And like you, I had a chance to run a radio station eight hours by myself. Oh, wow. And there's nothing like putting you know, pressure on you and, and you learn things that way that, uh, you know, might not otherwise. So um, it was just, I'm not asking a question here. I'm just saying, I, I think, uh, you know, how you started is a great example for others and, and uh, something that I will now in, engage with my granddaughters, encourage them to do the same thing. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, can I, I, oh, I, I, in college, I um, had, a, had a, we had a radio station and, and I was on afternoon drive and they gave me the keys and they promptly took them, took them away after I played two live crew. Uh, so, so you gotta be careful what you give people, especially young folks keys too. Uh, but thankfully you're a much more responsible guy than I am um, at that age. Um, any other, I see Sandra had a, a question. Sandra, are you uh, able to talk or would you like for one of us to talk for you? Um, I'll probably let's see here. What yeah, she is said, your let's, biggest, what's your biggest you learning read? from the PR efforts? There we go. Biggest cool. learnings from my PR efforts. What are my biggest learnings? Um, honestly, you know, I think the work that I do for my business just shows just how, um, it, it, it affirms everything that I've always told my clients over the years. You can do all the work, you can put in all the effort, but sometimes the outcomes are really out of your control. So for example, you know, this year I pitched my business for Black History Month and Valentine's Day around the same time. I pitched all the right editors. I did everything. I had the products, I had the, you know, all the things I would recommend for my clients. And I really did like rarely any placements at all. And it wasn't because of the hard work that I was doing. It was literally just because either a reporter didn't read my email or there was a better fit for the story or I just maybe got there too late. Um, so with some of these like managing my own expectations from the PR side that the work that I do, even though I know that it's fruitful and that I could be beneficial for the business, 
it's not always going to pan out the way that I want it to. And just because I'm the one that's doing it, it doesn't make it any different. Like my business could be, be a client's business and it doesn't mean that I'm going to land that big story. So um, I think that's the biggest learning lesson is that like, it doesn't matter if I'm pitching my business or somebody else's, I, I'm still going to give it the same effort. Sometimes I give my business a little less effort to be, if I'm being perfectly honest, but um, it does, sometimes it doesn't matter how, great of a story it is or how perfect of a fit I am I'm still at the mercy of someone else's decision on the other side of it when I'm dealing with like reporters and such nice um any other any tactical hacks she said Tac from what is that from a PR perspective or I, yeah like I assume that's what she's talking about yes there she goes to say yes tactical hacks I mean, you know, maybe like a few things, pointers. Like for me, like PR was one of those things. I, I got a weird relationship with PR because um, it feels like sometimes you can get ahead of your skis on PR um, and not be necessarily sure. ready. And sometimes entrepreneurs yeah. can spend too much time on PR mm -hmm. early on and they should just focus on the business, build the business yeah. instead of trying to. So, yeah, I totally get that. So a couple of, um, maybe I would just say tips that I would recommend from a PR perspective is um i would definitely get your website together because i found that a lot of people write about majors project pop and i never know i never know until maybe like i get some orders and i'm like and i look at my analytics and i can see where the leads are coming from so your website should have everything that it needs somebody needs to write a story about your business without ever getting in contact with you so that's the biggest thing is have your website ready because if a journalist needs to, you know, is working on something quickly, they need to be able to find that. So your website is like your biggest source and your social media for getting coverage because people will look for you there first before they ever email you. Um, the next thing is, you know, um, if you want to be featured in certain magazines or by reporters, start to engage with them on social media. So follow them, engage with them, and comment on their stories. If they wrote an awesome story that you loved, even if it has nothing to do with your business, send them an email because people love that and write them and say like, you know, subject line, great story, you know, exclamation point. And then just say, hi, X, Y, Z. I read your story and blah, blah, blah today. It really resonated with me. I loved your point about so-and-so keep up the great work. You know, now that person's like thinking about you and like, oh my God, I got the sweetest note today from someone. And then when you revisit them about your business, maybe a month or two down the line, it's not, it doesn't feel like this transactional thing. There's some sort of relationship that's being built there. And then I would say, um, you know, the biggest thing I would remind people is that, is like what Kyle just said, nothing as is as it seems when it's on social media or from a PR perspective. So um, you might, because you might see a brand getting a lot of coverage, um, it doesn't mean that they make a lot of money. <laughs> like PR and coverage don't necessarily lead to direct sales. And I tell my clients that all the time. And I tell myself that all the time. So for example, like if I got like last year, I got featured in um, Netflix's Jingle Jingle Shop. I don't know if you guys were familiar with that film, but um, they had created a shop online, like a virtual gift shop for the movie. And I got a decent amount of sales from it. But you would think if I told you like Netflix featured me on there, like, movie site that I'm going to get like a bajillion orders and it might have been like 50 you know but and I was great grateful for that but it's not always as it seems so um just keep that in mind because it can get when you start to do this PR thing as I like to say and pitch your business it can feel like maybe other people are really winning and you're not but when you're not getting the coverage you want, if you've got like different parts of your business, like your newsletter going on and um, other communications going on with clients, you can still get sales. You can still connect and convert um, just random people into believers and um, consumers of your business because PR is just li one, literally one arm of what, what you can do to market your business. Yeah, PR definitely is. Um, I want to double tap really quickly on a couple of things you said. Uh, it's definitely a relational thing in terms of reporters. I remember um, TechCrunch is a big publication for anybody in the tech industry. 
I had a relationship very early on with one of the writers. I would send her stories. I would comment on things. And so when it was time for us to get featured, um, she did it, right? Uh, because she looked at us differently and she actually wrote about us a couple of times and we gave her, um, so that was really, really helpful. And then the other thing is, um, is term, in terms of PR, it doesn't always translate to sales. It's like PR, yes, is, a, is, a, is one of the, the tactical things that you do in order to, to get sales. So multi, multi-pronged approach, part of one, yeah. one of the many arms, right? But, but what I realized is that people who were on TechCrunch when we got that story, yeah, we got 50,000 people visiting our website, but, but probably only 2% of them were our actual customers. And so it didn't translate to there. And so that's why I think I have this funny relationship with PR because like sometimes the money and effort spent into getting into a newspaper and the reality is it's like are all those people your customers and um, and when you're in a very early, very early stage of sales is everything and being extremely targeted and focused with your efforts um, I think matters and so that's why you know PR can be a danger point if you rely on it too much in terms of like sales generator um, major look we really appreciate you um, sharing your story with us today um, Super grateful. I'm glad that I had an opportunity to, to, to hear it. Um, you definitely built the case on why people should just take a stop through here, um, through Orlando and visit us because we're, we're, we're a big deal, we're a major deal. Um, they can come visit you. Um, they can enjoy your delicious popcorn. Um, and uh, we appreciate you. So thank you for your service. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> I, that was, I didn't do that. So for everybody that's watching, if you have any questions or if you just want to connect, feel free to, you know, you can hit me up on Instagram or you can email me for those of you that are like actually a part of the program. Um, you know, Kyle and Ben, feel free to give them my email address. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have or meet with you on Zoom or over a cup of coffee if you're local. And um, this is a really, really great program that you're a part of. I actually probably want to do this program um, just to further cement like my mission and why I do what I do. So keep it going and um, yeah, hit me up if you have any questions. Mm -hmm.